Kariba and the Zambezi Valley and Zim were just like, they impacted so heavily on me. Um, and unfortunately, I kind of had to leave that behind. And I was beautifully sort of surprised when my first posting, I got chucked into the Bavianskloof and it had just come over from Water Affairs. So when I asked my director, where is this place? And it wasn't called Bavianskloof, it was called Formosa, Coxcomb and Bavianskloof, I think, or Status, which were old forestry stations. He said he didn't know. So I thought I was really going to a dump and there I was, bam, chucked into this place. It is awesome. So essentially what I've done is I've taken all those energies, all that stuff from my Zim moments, and I translated it into Bavians. And I'm going to die there doing that because I really believe it's a wonderful opportunity that doesn't occur anywhere else in Africa at this point, in my opinion. These are some of the things we get up to. We believe this is like, this is part of our foundation, our backbone. We live in the Langkloof, and we have got quite a big sort of uh, rural population. And these guys are just so disconnected. Um, which is surprising and you'd expect it with the townies maybe to be quite disconnected and that's part of the problems that we deal with is disconnection um, but a lot of these brown kids and black kids and white kids they just got no connection to this area um, so we spend a lot of time working with kids groups um, and we find that really uplifting so this is the kind of thing what we do is we have a standard procedure we go to the schools we do a really creative lectures and stuff with them um, which is all curriculum based and it's all got local examples we then take the leadership core of that standard who become the prefix the following year and we take them on a day trip so we take them down with a beautiful uh, little piece of ground which is a bridge to the wilderness to the Bavians, um, and we take them on a day trip where we introduce them to how the elephant became a rain animal which is also an old sand story um, is very relevant in the curriculum a lot of them have quite a lot of sand blood still pumping through their veins, even though they don't know it. Um, and it's a beautiful contextualization um, of the story on the farm. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. Um, we then take them into a six-day, five-night camp. Um, and four of those nights are spent in fairly uh, nice sort of tented conditions in a really nice natural area. They spend one night out under the stars, come whatever, whatever the weather is. Um, and, yeah, that in itself is a massive experience. And they come back and we kind of clear everything up and we chat it through and we go home. Um, and we've done that quite a few times. Essentially, we're planting seeds. I mean, I can't sit here and tell you how wonderful the results are of that, but I know in, the, in my heart, good or bad, whatever the experience was, that seed is going to grow into something and if just two of those kids grow something good out of that we've done a lot actually um, okay you can whack through there yeah interestingly we just I'm not into I mean I'm not a drama boffin or anything but uh, we met a whole bunch of people and we thought a fantastic way of bringing this story to a wider range of people was to put it into a place so some of the kids were involved we met, and they were actually quite talented we went through it and we did the play essentially how the elephant became a ran animal and we had a really nice interpretation thing. We threw elephant dung in there. We had this huge big place. And uh, the, the farmers around were really cool. They brought in a whole lot of kids and mommies and grannies and opas for free in their transport. So for five nights we cooked. And the grannies and everybody got to see the kids. And they got to learn about this. And it was really cool. Um, and this, I mean, this story, which we can get to at some stage after a few beers, is a really nice story. And it's so linked to some of the really important things. Okay. These are just also some other things. We get very involved in the expo. So essentially what we do is some powerful messages which we need to get across, sneakily take it to these kids whose dads are the big farm owners and the big landowners. And they end up dealing with these. They're doing really well and we really pump them up. And uh, that's a good way of getting at the dads and the moms without like getting up their nose. And slowly but surely we're building up momentum. Okay, this is what we're going to be dealing with today. It, it revolves around our big vision uh, and it's a, a sustainable development plan for the region. But this has local, national, uh, international significance. We believe it's a benchmark. Um, and we believe we would have pulled this off long ago. But hey, man, the politics and things in the country have become rather tricky. So yeah, maybe the 21st of December will have a powerful impact. This is a really important resource. We can maybe dabble a bit with that later. Um, honeybush tea, the, the honeybush tea industry essentially is Bavian's Cliff, and this is Cyclopia Intermedia, which is what's called Berti. It's a re-sprouter. 
It's been around forever. It's been utilized forever. Um, and it holds an incredible, it's almost like a godsend, this. And I know people will be thinking, oh, you know, sustainable utilization of a wild resource. Uh oh, true. But the advantages of doing this right, and we can do it right now, are just awesome. So we'll get to that. Bang it over. Yeah, in the uh, jaws and Bavians, it's quite interesting, and you'll get to learn a little bit more about Bavians, but we did a buff introduction reintroduction after many many years and they are doing awesomely well black rhino back in there we put in Ireland, we put in mountain zebs it's a basically a big five region um, potentially within the context of the bavians bavians being 200,000 hectares at present um yeah we've been trying our stuff as well with our local municipality which is a nightmare but again we've been really cool and we worked it here we were sitting in holland with the the mayor of uh Drimilin, oh, and the mayor of Kokamu, that's our mayor there, the, the, the Oki on the right, and he's our ambassador, blah, blah, blah. We got them hooked with Drimilin to twin as a municipality. And I mean, it's a really a struggling municipality. And basically the deal was signed and sealed. All they had to do was come back to South Africa, sort out a whole lot of stuff, and there was 26 million was going to be thrown at them just to start this off. They still haven't got that right. So anyway, but that doesn't mean we haven't uh, continued, but uh, it's a bit frustrating. These are some of the other things we do. I mean, we just, this area is just awesome. And Jude knows a little bit about it. My kids certainly do. And some of you know a little bit about it. We'll deal with a little bit of it as we go through. What imagine crucial. Bavian's Cliff and the Upper Crom um, are absolutely vital strategic resources from a water point of view for the whole of the Eastern Cape. They feed pea and Utenaig. Um, and we would all know that it's time to start looking at our water resources. So it drives us. It's our foundation. We had two uh, working for water projects which are up and running, which are water-based, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That's the Coca Dam. I was mentioning earlier Kariba and the Zambezi Valley. This is my mini Kariba. And you've got a really narrow 90-meter wall, 35-meter long dam, which is built in 67. Um, yeah, these are some of the issues. You know, we've got this huge protected area, which is predominantly Feinbos, um, and we have all this marginal sort of stock farming areas, and we've continually got this battle between, you know, the farmers and the wild areas, and the predators especially. Um, and if any of you have heard of the Bredalkal and Bull Smuts and the Landmark Foundation and Leopards and Gin Traps and all that, this is like a boiling debate at the moment, very emotionally charged. But like the old seals getting clubbed in the good old days with the pictures of the bubbly eyes and the big clubbers. So it's still there. What we believe also as part of our plan is we've got all the tools to eradicate that friction. Um, anyway, obviously last bastion of the sand. We loved the idea of linking the, the original, the sand people, into the context of what we're going to deal with in our main presentation. I mean... Uh, the sites there, Natasha and I have been deep into the mountains, luckily enough to get into the helicopter, which we, and then we walked out. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I know the area fairly well. There's stuff there which is just unknown to science. It's beautiful, it's awesome, and in some of these caves, it's literally left the way it was. So, you know, it is truly a wilderness. You know? White people haven't been in there, and nor have Kozas. The only dudes who've been in there in a lot of these places are the old Bushmen, and they're all gone. Okay, this is now what stands in the Constitution regarding the environment, just to refresh your memories if you are not aware of it, but it's powerful stuff. It's awesome. I mean, when this constitution came out, I didn't take my package. I didn't run away. I thought, whoa, this is the time. I actually thought, now we can actually do it. And some of the best brains in the country, luckily at the time, closely working with the ANC, were kind of a little bit under pressure to make the right calls and also probably a little bit naive about where we ought to be doing and where we're going, brought out this stunning piece of legislation, which still stands today, hopefully. Interestingly, I was around in this policy making time, as I said, I was like really pumped and excited. And <coughs> these are just some really fundamentals that came out of these white paper discussions, which were really nicely workshopped all over the country, not like our e-tolling. It was actually done properly and they actually had some really good heads all together and they came up with a whole lot of stuff. So the white paper on biodiversity, environment and tourism are excellent policy documents. They are stunning. In fact, if we, imp if we implemented any of that, Man, oh man, this country would be rocking. You know, we probably wouldn't be sitting here now. We'd be just doing. Um, so, and you're going to see that this is really crucial. 
Okay, this is what the IUCN, and this is really cool. This is how they suggest your kind of conservation framework ought to look. And I mean, it's incredibly sensible. It's really logical. And it starts with a category one, which is the top of the pile, and it ends with a category six, which is the bottom of the pile. Um, interestingly, in Africa, to date, we do not have a category one. Um, you know, we, we deal with category two national parks, provincial parks, and state forests. Um, and if you go back to the <coughs> old kind of setup like that, you know, uh, provincial parks, it's all mixed and, and, and messed up. National parks, when 94 came around, when this new policy came into place, I was absolutely convinced that by now, in 2012, we would have had a, a wilderness area. We don't, and Bavi Hanskloff has always been the perfect candidate for that. We've had a wilderness foundation with the in players and, and all the guys, the wild foundation from the States. But I mean, what happened was a dude, Bill Bainbridge, who's a really cool forester, originally the Forest Act didn't have anything about wilderness. So what he managed to do with the Ukeshlamba and the Drakensberg, through a lot of lobbying and a lot of help from Ian Play and all the big canonies in the old apartheid setup, he managed to get wilderness mentioned in the Forest Act. So the minister could declare an area a wilderness area. But it wasn't to jury. In other words, it didn't have an act to have it managed. So every dude who came along into Natal Parks Board, who became the new manager of, of Drakensberg, he could chop and change depending on what he liked. So there wasn't any sort of fastigheid uh, about it. So yeah, you're quite right. And now we have the Protected Areas Management Act, which also has a nice big mention. So essentially it's the old Forest Act in some relatively good legislation, and now there's a little wilderness part. But similarly, the same problems uh, are there. So, okay. And that is really the point also of this, the, the, this uh, presentation, is that we do not have a Category 1. And you might ask, well, so what? You know, but... Having that category one has massive implication for everything we do in conservation, and hopefully we'll get to that. Um, I'm just re referring back again to these clear, glaring holes in our environment armor before the new legislation. And, I mean, you can just read through that clearly. You can see everything was very ad hoc, very demarcar, fragmented, all kind of upside down. And it was recognized in all those policy documents and the legislation specifically... Go down one touch? Oh, okay. I'll get to the legislation, but NEMBA and the Water Act are probably our, some of our fine, some of the finest environmental legislation in the world. Unfortunately, legislation that's not implemented or uh, managed and controlled and sorted means zip. And that's the reality. However, at least we have the stuff there, and we can potentially hold people accountable to that when they get around to it. Okay, understanding wilderness areas, legal wilderness and its management. Now, any preconceived ideas about wilderness, you need to quickly just throw out the window here and just recognize that all we're talking about today is legal wilderness, the jury wilderness. In other words, it's basically like a National Parks Act, except you have a Wilderness Area Act, and the Wilderness Area Act determines how you manage that area and towards what goal. And it is fundamentally totally different to anything we've seen in Africa, certainly almost the opposite of a national park, in a sense. So, and the definition of a wilderness, which would be the foundation of any Wilderness Act, which was came out of the President's Council 91, I personally don't think it's the greatest uh, definition. And obviously, a definition is crucial. Um, but it'll give you an idea of what it is. A natural or undeveloped landscape, unspoiled and unscarred by man's activities and far removed from areas of development and human habitation. To merit recognition as a wilderness in the categorization of nature areas, it must be of sufficient size to be ecologically viable and also to provide what is termed a wilderness experience as experienced by our forefathers. Okay. And again, you guys will know something about conservation, I'm sure, sitting here, but... The key management concepts of a wilderness area would be it's a valuable, enduring resource. Wilderness is a resource and is a core asset around which you create a sustainable regional land use plan. Okay, so uh, it's a bit different. It's also non-motorized. There is no vehicular anything in wilderness. It's horse, walk, or 
wind power or something, but there's nothing motorized. Not even a battery engine for your bass boat. It's totally non-motorized, which I must admit initially I struggled with. And I had this big American dude from the forestry service trying to tell this game ranger that non-motorized, I just seemed no it, you know, that don't work like it. And I thought it was absolutely ridiculous. And it took three or four weeks of really growing for that penny to finally drop, you know. Non-motorized, that's a crucial thing. It's zone fenced. It's not like a, a national park with a massive big cable fence around it. You've got lions in a double fence and it's electrified and blah, blah, blah. It's zone fenced. It's invisible fencing, which is really cool. Um, we'll get to that. And the management style is not hands-on. It's not going murder the elephants because they're getting too many or go and burn these blocks and sort out that and change that camp and make a new camp and uh, take the rubbish out and all that. It's not a hands-on management. It's a reactionary management. So essentially the area is large enough, it's fairly it's ecologically viable. To a large extent you would react. So something that would be reactionary would be getting in and maybe getting exotics out potentially where you have some bad areas. That would be the kind of management style. Um, fire, for example, is not block burning and stuff like it. Natural burning zone. If the lightning moves it and it burns, it burns. If a fire comes in from the outside, you try and stop it. It's as simple as that. So, okay, zap through that. I don't know if this is going to make sense. I try to think of something really simple, but that's as simple as it gets. A national park, islands of biodiversity, they talk about that. Um, if you think of Kruger, I mean, Kruger is well over a million hectares. When I was a kid and I went to Kruger, if I took a snapshot then, I take a snapshot now. It's a whole different world. I mean, there's a city inside uh, Kruger. Um, and essentially what we do is, that's just the, how national parks works. And that's also the kind of limits of national park, <coughs> is that basically you eat your reserve up from the inside. It's like a slow-growing cancer, especially in a Kruger. And the generational kind of gap that is there we just don't pick it up. And the kids of today keep Kruger's awesome, and it is. But it's different, and it's getting different every year. Um, and you know, since 94, essentially we've entrenched even deeper and with uh, less kind of uh, sympathy this national park ethos. They've taken away the subsidies. Tourism's become the big thing, and they run the parks. It's money-based. I'm not knocking our national parks in the sense that we have some wonderful national parks. We need national parks. But we need national parks that work in a system and understand what it is they ought to be doing. And we need to shift that balance a little bit. It's not money driven. Yes, it's important, I accept. But that isn't the be all and end all of it. And obviously it's hands on management. Zap over. Okay, now wilderness area, I didn't give you a nice picture because this is the fundamental difference is that wilderness areas are large, a bit like Kruger, but they have a very small look inside. The inside look would be reactionary management and research, really important. If we don't know what we got, how the hell do we know uh, what to conserve? The beautiful thing about wilderness areas is that you can just go in and look and find, and then you know what you're conserving, but because it's big enough, it's, cons it's looking after itself. We're not stuffing it up. So it's kind of learning about the place, then thinking about how we ought to go about things. And also, the focus is very much out, you know, with, you cannot have a wilderness area in a vacuum. It's not an island of biodiversity. You need to zone and to grow. So, a bit like dropping a stone in the pool, it does that kind of ring effect. That is what it's all about. So, in each of these zones, as the closer you come to the wilderness, the, the more restrictions there are on what you can and can't do. So, the further you get out, the less. You can imagine... Uh, 20,000 people flying into PE and all wanting to go and have a jaw in our wonderful natural environment there. Of the 25,000, let's say, four would have their backpack on their back and would actually go into that wilderness area. All the rest get absorbed in that whole area. But the power of the whole system revolves around that core. Just knowing it's there is the attraction. And if everybody else kind of works in, in line with that, you have a system that is potentially sustainable. And what we've been doing for the last 20 years in our region is growing catalysts. And that's where um, we like to think we're pragmatic. So essentially you try and get a small sensible thing that represents a bigger thing and you make it work and you make it, 
you want, so that it serves as a kind of a benchmark because you've always got the cynics and the mother grandies and it's a new concept they're going to say it doesn't work where have you seen it where have you do whatever we need to just get this thing working and Bavi Hanscliff is that for us over that Tash okay that's the focus of the area this is basically what it looks like I stuck a green line around this would be our vision for the future for this um, and that obviously you can see the Bavi Hanscliff protected area that's 200,000 hectares Formosa Forest Reserve, which is a long chunk of the mountains in the Sitsikama. Na naturally, the Sitsikama National Park, which in itself is a world-class national park. And may I add, fairly well managed, mainly because it's largely inaccessible, um, the ocean part, you know, unless you go out in a boat, which is guided. And it's quite sort of narrow along the coast, and it's pretty tough. Anybody who's done the Otto will know. It's not Mickey Mouse. It's quite a mission. Um, and it's a beautiful park. Um, and then we've got the Kamenasi and the Grundal. But this green area, that would be the focus. That would be, the Bavi Hanscliff would be that central ring, and this would ring out all that whole region through. But that is the core area for me, and that's 1.2 million hectares, plus minus. That's as big as Kruger. And, yeah, it is just such an amazing area. If you just think about it from a, a historical point of view, the Koza never got that far. The Bura and the Engelsmanna, they never got in there. Um, you don't have all these land claim things, you don't have these those kicked out, there's no mining, there's no, there's nothing like that. A lot of these dynamics don't exist there. Um, yeah. Is the and, source of the Storms River in there? Yeah, Storms River is basically in the Sitz National Park. That little green tree there was yeah. green. And, and where's the source of it? The storm source is, yeah, it's a very short little tributary that comes out of the Sitsikama Mountains. It's actually a very short river. And is Carrido just outside of the area? Uh, Carrido is, no, no, Carrido is there. there, there. Yeah. So there's, there's, a, there's a little point of contention. So again, yeah, so essentially what I've done is I've just chopped it there. And I've given you a cross section, just so you get an idea of what we're talking about. And let's go back to the other one. Just some interesting things are down one. The home of Sarah Bartman. We all heard about Sarah Bartman. I mean, the NC and the government and everybody made a big boo high and jumped around and went and did the whole story. Uh, the Khamtuas, this region, is basically where Sarah comes from. She's one of the last Khoisan kind of buzz. We found a Kocha mummy, a sand mummy, which is 2,000 years old, which we discovered. And uh, there's a whole lot of interesting. You can Google the sand mummy. There's the Classies River Caves which sit just down the coast there, not far from that lovely golf course that you mentioned and those wealthy lads. And I mean, essentially, I mean, uh, Hilary Deacon, that's where his research took place and 120,000 years of modern human history come out of those caves. So the cradle of mankind thing links very strongly to classes. Um, and it links nicely into old Tellinger stuff as well, in a sense. Um, it's a World Heritage Site, the Bavians, one of the three legs Cedarburg, Swatberg, Bochoritz, and Bavians. Um, what are some other interesting things? It's the deciduous fruit basket of the Eastern Cape, a large chunk of South Africa, maybe. Citrus and vegetables, tobacco in the Khamtuas. So it has really cool and strong uh, agricultural ventures, which all need to link to green things now because the markets are demanding it. So we've got these guys kind of almost there. Anyway, Biomes. okay, let's, sorry? Biomes. Yeah, we're going to get there now on the next one, on the one after that. Okay, so this is just some interesting stuff about the region. You can see we've got those three mountain ranges parallel to the sea. They basically all lie on the 34, which is the equinox, um, which has all sorts of significance. Two very important river systems and the Krom, which is not on there. That's the Kocha and the Bavians. They feed the Kocha Dam, which is a really big, powerful water reservoir. And the source of the Krom, which goes down to Cape St. Francis, which feeds two very important dams, Ilansiach and the um, Churchill Dam, that's basically P and Utenag's water supply. Um, another interesting thing, it's right in the middle of the summer, winter rainfall. We get summer rainfall and we get winter rainfall. Um, we go right up to 1,500 meters and beyond 1,800 meters, 2,000 meters. So we go from alpine to sea level. We go from minus 4 in the winter, snow on the mountains, to 40 degrees in the summer. Um, we've got this fantastic mountain wilderness. Um, interestingly, essentially all the biomes of South Africa are contained within that big green stretch we're talking about. All of our biomes. And not only 
are a lot of the species which occur in South Africa all there too. We have a lot of endemic species. In other words, species that have adapted to all these interesting conditions, this ecotone of biomes that only occur there and nowhere else in the world. So it's really, really special. We have the big six. It's not just a mountain area. It's a, it's a big six. We can put Jumbo back in the end line. That's going to be a bit of a mission, but ultimately I see that being possible. Oh. Um, Honeybush tea is part of the picture. It's, it's a boiling pot of South African culture. A guy, I don't know if you've ever heard of a Kundra Dubais dude. He's a bit of an old Goliath that came from the early, or a, yeah, from the earlier days. I think it was a French Huguenot. A very interesting story. Uh, guys like the first president of, or one of the first presidents of the old system, uh, Stradom, comes from this area. P.H. Norkia comes from the area. Uh, circles in the forest, Dalian Matias stuff, all this. This is a really cool place with a lot of interesting people who've made up its history. The spot you're talking about by the golf course was all John Forster's big jaw. Yeah, that's all the yeah. Up. exactly. So, it, uh, but over and above that, this was probably the last bastion for the sand. There is a small Koza kind of offshoot, which are probably a bunch of skabangas got jacked away by the Koza, who ended up down there, the Fingos. They didn't quite get into those mountains, but they're around. Um, and we've got the Bura, and we've got the Engels, and we've got the whole mix there. And sometimes they're all in one person, you know, so it's really interesting. We, you know, just very broadly speaking, we looked at a three-phase plan. And our first phase, phase one, is legislation. We need a Wilderness Act. And it ain't hard, man. And we have, this dude is one of the finest, in my opinion, environmental minds. I think he's still alive, Davovic. He did his PhD thesis. Here we have a magnificent draft Wilderness Act. Um, and I mean, this could be tabled in a parliament already. It is cooking. It's ready to go. Um, so we need to try and get a lobby going to get that going. If we can get a Wilderness Act in place, that immediately means that is the top conservation body in the country. That's above national parks. Essentially, this becomes your filter for the whole conservation system. It essentially changes the whole system the way it ought to have been changed, <coughs> changed demanded by our policy, which hasn't happened till yet. Our national parks have entrenched some of the old crap, and they've entrenched it even deeper, and they're doing it better. And that's not good for conservation at all. So that's one of the things we need to do. We need to get this legislation in place. And you, we believe... And I don't think we'll have too much argument that this Bavi Anskloof is one of the finest candidate wilderness areas in South Africa, certainly, maybe even in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, who knows, but it is awesome.